Okay, happy week. I believe it's week 15. Can you believe we've gotten really to the last week where we're doing actual studying of the new learning material? And next week, we will be revising for the exam four and practical four. And then we've got our finals week. But like I said, this is the final week when we are covering new material. And a lot of the material that I had scheduled for us to cover this week, we have actually already looked at during our last week when we kind of combined the male and female reproductive systems in order to make it a little bit more comparison of the two and have that discussion included in that as well. So rather than going through the female reproductive system uh, once again, uh, you can find all that from last week's learning material. And I'll put a link to the end of this video for anyone who feels that they just want to quickly revise that. Rather than doing that, I thought that what we'll do, we'll use this live online session that we have scheduled for today to kind of do a fun little activity that takes the story a little bit further from where we ended last time. And then of course, to revisit uh, what we covered on this week's lab, which was your final lab, and that was all about the fetal big dissection. Um, it is going to be a lab that's going to be very, very, very difficult to do by yourself. If you miss the actual class time, I can't immediately from the top of my head come up with an idea how we could get you a chance to take part on this lab if you were unable to come to the class in person. But I still want to provide the learning material, the big takeaway home, uh, take home points. So uh, I do want to go through it uh, with you, even though I don't know if, if there's so much that you can gain from it in terms of the points towards your final grade. But like I said, I think that um, what we should do to start with today is a little bit of a taking the story from where we last ended and going further from there. And to do that, I'm going to need you to have a couple of uh, pieces of tools that are going to come in very handy. And if you attended in a classroom, you were provided this. If you didn't have a chance to join me this week in person, uh, I'm sure you can access these materials independently as well. So the first thing that we'll need is a marker. So any marker that writes on plastic will do just fine. And the second thing that you'll need is a ping pong ball. And I had a bunch of ping pong balls uh, with me in a classroom. It's always fun to show up to this class uh, and meet other faculty on the hallways as they're wondering that I thought you guys were doing science, not sports. But the ping pong ball is going to be very important and you'll simply need just one of the ping pong balls. And there's many different kinds available and there's many brands and it really doesn't matter what you go for. So the first thing that I ask you to do is to take your ping pong ball and decorate it, make it somehow cute. This is going to be now uh, in the little baby that, whose journey from the early fertilization to actually being born will have a look. So um, how you choose to decorate your ball, I'm totally open to that. I've done my very best of drawing a small baby on the uh, ball. You might have a little bit more artistic abilities than I have. It's totally up to you. But uh, just decorate the ball, make it cute. And during the time when class was working on the decorating their ping pong balls, we had a little look of a sketch by some of my 
favorite comedians back from UK. And this sketch, um, I'm going to link it to the end of this video, just to make sure that I'm not dabbling into any copyright issues. But it's a sketch of uh, two schoolgirls, and they discuss about this confusing world of uh, what it is when, when the uh, fertilization happens and new life starts. What's going on all there? And of course, this is a humor driven sketch. Uh, but I think that what we're getting away from it is seeing that how easy it is to have misconceptions about topics that we don't know a lot about. So it really was there to show some of the kind of more sillier misconceptions that people may have on this topic, but also to open up the discussion. And I think that we always try in all of these classes to clarify any misconceptions that anyone might have. So uh, that was what we spent the time while we were decorating these ping pong balls. Well, once you have your ping pong ball, uh, you'll need a third piece of equipment, if you wish, for this activity. And that's simply going to be a normal uh, balloon from any party supply store, or you can find it in most uh, regular stores uh, as well. It doesn't matter as long as it is elastic balloon that will do the job just fine. So uh, the first thing that we need to do is to get the ping pong ball inside the balloon. And if you just try to open the balloon a little bit and put the ping pong ball in, let's see if we can do that. It's going to get stuck. It's going to be difficult. And the word stuck is something that we never like to have associated with the childbirth. Uh, so what you have to do really is to get your fingers in all the way to the very bottom of the balloon, uh, cranking it open and then putting the balloon, uh, the ping pong ball inside the balloon. It often is easier to work together uh, with someone. So teamwork gets you far. Obviously, I practiced this a few times. Uh, I've taught this uh, activity quite a few times, but uh, the goal is to have the ping pong ball inside the balloon. And um, normally, I think it's a fun thing always to have the students to put their own ping pong ball inside the balloon. But uh, like I said, if you're struggling, feel free to ask for help from uh, any anyone. Uh, it's, it's always easier to work as a teamwork. So now that we have the ping pong ball inside the balloon, we're going to inflate this balloon about halfway full. And um, if you have one of those party pumps that helps you to add air, you can totally do that as well. I realize we're kind of on our way of coming out of the pandemic. So some might be a little nervous doing that in a class uh, with everyone blowing into their own balloons. If you do it, blow into the balloons, don't aim the stream of air towards anyone else. So let's fill it about halfway up. That seems very nice to me. And give the neck of the balloon a little tug, and then um, you turn the balloon with the dangly bit facing downwards and let the ping pong ball inside settle into the bottom. It might rotate initially a little bit, but eventually it will settle in there to the bottom of the balloon. And um, now when you let go, the ping pong ball will actually stop the air from flowing out from the balloon. So a uh, balloon will stay inflated. That takes a little bit of a faith. And that's the first part of this lab where you just need to trust the process. So what we have here is a model 
of our uterus. So we have our fundus, the top part. Remember, we've seen the word fundus multiple times. Also in other organs, we've seen fundus of gallbladder, fundus of stomach, and so on and so on. So fundus was always either the top part of an organ or the part of an organ that's the furthest way away from the opening of that structure. Body, not surprisingly, and again, we've seen the term body being used when we talk about different structures in the body, is the part that forms the majority of that structure. So we've seen, for example, body of the mandible uh, before, and now body of the uterus forms the, about two thirds of the uterus. And then finally, we're going to have our cervix, this dangly little bit in this model. So if you just take your balloon and you start squeezing from the sides, not much is going to happen to the balloon. Uh, you end up that the neck of the balloon still remains the same, and there's really not opening at the end of it either. So these contractions from the side of the balloon are comparable to those of the Braxton Hicks contractions, which are just kind of uh, practice contractions that are more common towards the end of the pregnancy. They do not do that much to the uh, cervix. So the real contractions happen actually at the very top of the uterus. So we can move our hands there. And this is where the power of the contractions originates from. As the muscle fibers on the top shorten and thicken, they squeeze the top and pull up the uterus on the sides, as you can start to see the happening. And this model really is a very good comparison to the real contractions that we're going to see. So everyone can just squeeze and relax, squeeze and relax, and a little bit at the time. And what you will see is that we're actually getting the thinning of the cervix starting to happen down here. Note that not much dilation is happening while we are still working on shortening the cervix. This is much of the work that takes place during the early labor. Uh, it is much more about shortening of the cervix and less about the dilation. And uh, this will just keep going on. And uh, once we get much, much, much thinner with the cervix, we're ready to start with the dilation. So now we're getting to this very exciting part of the uh, labor. And a lot of people get a little nervous when we do this activity in a classroom at this stage. They're getting a little anxious that, am I going to be able to do that? And we have a bit of a giggle about it in the classroom. We talk about all the things we've learned, having those deep breaths, and giving it one more good squeeze. And there we have the baby has been born. Obviously, this is simply a kind of a quick summary, uh, bringing together some of the concepts that we've seen and all the kudos and all the credit to all the mothers who have gone through this process. If only it was as easy as we just demonstrated. Uh, so there you go. This is an absolute riot in a class and everyone seems to always find it very entertaining. And feel free to take this exercise with you and uh, show others how babies do come out. Or if you're in a boring office meeting, take it there too. That al always seems to be a kind of a fun thing that people enjoy a lot doing. So that was the first thing that I was hoping for us to do uh, during this uh, review session. And the second thing that I want to do is, as I said earlier on, is to revisit all of the things that we saw during our 
fetal pig dissection act. So let's just, just share that screen together so we can look at it together and be on the same page there. So that looks very good to me. So one thing that I want to start with and kind of remind us is that the fetal pigs that we use in the class, they were not grown for the dissection purpose. They're a byproduct of the meat production process. So no extra lives were sacrificed for you to be able to have this experience. Quite the opposite, we're making use of something that would normally go discarded and go to the waste. So we're wanting to make sure that uh, there's as much learning that we can possibly get out of this activity. The other thing that I do want to mention is that I completely understand and honor that we have different ethical standards, different views of life, different beliefs. So if any student ever feels uncomfortable with taking part on this dissection activity, that is absolutely fine. You can observe, you can be the note taker, you can document the process for your peers. And if you feel uncomfortable being present in the classroom, then by talking to me, we always have alternative options. So don't hesitate doing that either. The final thing before we actually jump into this fetal pig dissection activity that I wanted to mention, and we've kind of touched upon this earlier in our previous dissection labs, is about the lab safety. So we've gone through the lab safety before, and uh, I can happily put a link to the end of this video for anyone who's curious to revise that. But we remember that we need to wear pro proper protective personal equipment, so goggles and gloves. Uh, we also remember we need to have closed toe shoes and so on. Uh, all of the embalming liquids and embalming processes that we use for our dissections on this course are completely safe based on our current knowledge. They do not contain any form aldehyde. So uh, we do not to the very, very best. And we've done a lot of work there to find the safest possible solutions. There should not be any risks for any of the students. Uh, I also want to remind you, and we've discussed this earlier on, that of course this is a learning activity, so we want to get as much as possible out of it. And we also want to be respectful about uh, the inherent value that every living creature has. So this is a great gift that we have a chance to learn free from these fetal pigs. So we want to treat them also with respect. So uh, even though I always in a class say that if you are curious to take a picture, you can definitely do so if you're curious to take a video. I've even had some students with huge numbers of TikTok views. As long as we do it in a respectful manner, I'm okay with that. And we want to make sure that we respect the privacy of the other students in the class as well. So the very first thing that I asked you to do uh, when you got your fatal pig was to determine the sex of the pig that you'll be working with. So um, there is a sex difference that we can see fairly early on during the development. And again, you're going to have fetal pigs of various different ages in the classroom. So on some, it will be more obvious and easier to spot than on the others. But by large, the rule of thumb that we can use is that for females, the urogenital opening is near of the anus. And you will also be able to see this urogenital papilla uh, present, typically. For the males, the urogenital opening is actually near to the umbilical cord. So that should help you as you navigate through trying to determine the sex 
of the pig that you're working with in your group. And I really think that these two diagrams are extremely good ones helping us here. So looking with the male, we see the urogenital opening very close to the uh, umbilical cord, whereas with the female, the urogenital opening, the genital papilla is closer to the anus, and then we have umbilical cord some distance away. Uh, in terms of the directional terminology, I think that this activity is a great chance to practice that a little bit. And we end up seeing that even though we're familiar with the term anterior referring to the front and posterior referring to the back, we're going to have a little bit of a different terminology now since we are talking of an animal that stands on four legs unlike humans. So whereas with the humans, we had superior and we had inferior, superior referring to the structures above, inferior structures below. Now, in case of the pig, we're talking of the dorsal and ventral side. Dorsal referring towards the spine, towards the back, and ventral referring towards the belly side. So I hope that that helps you as uh, we just want to revise really this pig dissection activity is a great chance to kind of cover everything you've learned in Bio 201 and 202. So it's, it's a great reminder for us. A couple of other terms that I believe that you are familiar, we're of course going to have our lateral side of the body and medial side. So medial referring closer towards the midline, whereas lateral is further away from the midline. Of course, also when we're talking about limbs, we might have proximal part, which is closer to the origin of the limb, and distal part, which is further away from the origin of the limb or from the trunk. So the very first thing that I asked you to look for when you started to work with your fiddle pig was to look at the mouth and locate the hard palate and soft palate. So the roof of the mouth. And what we saw that the hard palate uh, had a bony structure located inside there, whereas the soft palate as more of just a soft tissue, so you can really feel the difference. So another, another thing that I'm asking you to look at is the tongue of the pig, and especially on the surface of the tongue, to look for those sensory papillae, those taste parts. Sometimes it can be a little bit challenging for you to see inside the pig's mouth, so you might need to help that process a little bit by doing a small incision on the sides of the mouth to release that muscle tension a little bit that we're able to see back there. Uh, if you're able to open the mouth and look to the very back, you might start to see the a start of the oesophagus, the back of the mouth, uh, from the back of the mouth, so the tube that carries the food to the uh, stomach. One thing that I do want to emphasize here is that when you are doing that first time fetal pig dissection, be aware that there's going to be teeth present there on the fetal pig's mouth. Um, so compared to the humans, pigs are born with teeth. And remember, these are teeth that this pig has never used before. So they might be sharpish. Uh, so just be mindful of that as you're working your way through. Uh, here we have a little bit more of a view from the back of the uh, mouth. And it's kind of oriented in a weird angle. Keep in mind that the front of the mouth would be here with the hard palate. The uh, back of the roof of the mouth is here with the soft palate, and we're going to see our epiglottis and glottis there. So if you're having a hard time seeing all the way back to the pig's mouth, like I said, you can cut the angles of the jaw a little bit so you can expand it and see further in there. 
Uh, we also had a chance to talk in the classroom that what causes some of this tension of the muscles that you can sometimes see uh, on the samples that you're working with. And if you remember the concept of rigor mortis, which translated literally from Latin to rigid death, you might remember that the actin and myosin filaments on the sliding filaments model, so you remember the actin and myosin filaments slid past each other on a microscopic level of when we were talking of the muscle microanatomy. Uh, at the death, the calcium binds the actin and myosin together and they're no longer able to move during the rigor mortis. And this is one of the things that helps us with a little bit of timing of the death, figuring that out. Rigor mortis typically uh, proceeds from the head towards downwards uh, of the body. And that can last depending on the environmental factors from one to four days in duration. So that's why we might see sometimes that we need to actually cut through the muscle to be able to access these parts. Uh, at the very back of the mouth, you can also see probably the pharynx. Like I said, that would divide then to esophagus and trachea. Remember trachea carrying the air to the lungs and further along the respiratory tree. Um, other thing that now that we kind of move a little bit away from the mouth that I wanted us to consider a little bit was that what would be the gestational age of the pig that you're working with? And to figure that out, I've provided you the information that a full term of a pig typically is somewhere between 112 to 150. 15 days. And as we commonly do, not just with pigs, but in a embryonic development and fetal development of kind of determining the age of the developing life, really the length provides us a great age estimate. So I have some of the ages that might help you to get started as you're working through the A and figuring out the age of the uh, in individual fetal pig that your group is working with. Uh, we can use the length really to uh, do a pretty good estimate of how far along the way that pig is on the development. At around uh, 22 centimeters, we're looking at just about 100 days of development. And a uh, full term big at the 112 to 115 days, we would expect the pig to be about 30 centimeters in length. So the question that I asked from each of the groups was to come up with an estimate that how old your fetal pig is. We also spend a little bit of time looking at the external anatomy, uh, looking at the number of posts per feet. So I'm going to leave that for you to figure out. Uh, I don't want to give away all the answers. So that's something that's worthwhile to look at. We also look at the eyes of the fetal pig that you were working with. Uh, if you carefully open the eyelid or if the eyelid will not open, you can just remove it with gentle dissection and retraction. And uh, I asked you to study whether the eyeball and the eyes seem well developed. We are going to be a, seeing some of the cloudiness on the eyes simply as a process that happens after death. So that's not unusual, but we're really looking at the development of the eyeball. Does the pig eye seem well developed uh, at this age? And what we end up finding is that the eyes are very, very well developed. And in fact, pigs are born with being able to see uh, all the way from the very beginning of their life, uh, their postnatal life. Uh, then we moved on to do a little bit of dissection on the cheek area of the pig and uh, laying the pig down on the dissecting pan and uh, cutting away the skin. Um, 
was the first step that we needed to do. And remember, we always work in layers when we dissect. So simply just remove the skin. You can always go deeper and then remove structures below that, such, such as subcutaneous fat tissue or even muscle layers, other connective tissue structures there. But it's hard if you're going too deep to reverse that process. So layer by layer, if you remove the skin and work your way down, I'm asking you to find the masseter muscle. You might remember masseter muscle from humans running from zygoma to the angle of the mandible, this powerful muscle of mastication that really helps to bring the jaw closed with strong force. A couple of other things that we can see on this area are also lymphatic vessels or lymphatic nodes and vessels, but especially the salivary gland. Uh, I often describe them, and I know it's not the prettiest description, but they look a little bit like a chewed up chewing gum uh, if you're trying to have an idea of what you might see there. And I think that this diagram does a beautiful job of really showing us the masseter muscle running to the angle of the mandible, and we're also seeing our uh, salivary gland here. Uh, like we saw, there might be occasional lymph nodes as well, uh, and we have the facial nerve running on this side as well. And you remember, this is why operating on this area, especially on the humans, was so problematic, so nerve-wracking, because we have to be so mindful and so careful with the facial nerve, so we don't end up damaging that, and with a uh, partial facial paralysis. That would not be good news for us. So let's continue our journey. And the next thing is that now we're actually getting ready to look inside the fetal pig of various structures. And a lot of students at this point are telling me that, no, I don't need to do this. I'm going to be just fine. I don't need to secure the pig on the dissecting tray. But the reality is that from an experience, uh, I tell you that it helps you a lot. And sooner or later, students tend to come back during the dissecting activity and say that, oh, it would have helped. Can you now help me to tie, hog tie the pig? So what you do, you put your pig on its back with the legs facing upwards, and you run either a rubber band or a serious link of rubber bands from the uh, front legs and from the hind legs, from left side to the right side, run the string or the rubber band underneath the dissecting tray so that the pig kind of lays there with the legs uh, pointing more to the side so you have space to work on this region. Again, we are simply trying to make sure that we optimize how much we can get out of this act. So, what I asked you to do is to first start with the abdominal region. And you cut along the dotted lines here, so behind the front legs, and also down towards the umbilical cord. But do not remove the umbilical cord. We'll save that for later structures. Rather go around it and then cut again to the sides uh, at the front of the hind leg. And uh, start again with a shallow cut through the skin and retract those parts. And then you can work your way through uh, subcutaneous layers and muscle layers until you have the abdominal cavity completely open and we're able to start to study structures that we see there. So some of the structures that I'm asking you to identify within the abdominal cavity include the diaphragm. You remember this was the thin sheet of muscle that separated the thoracic and abdominal cavity, main respiratory muscle, so for the process of inhalation, breathing in. You will also see very prominent liver. Remember that proportionally liver is going to be very large on a newborn. Whether we're talking of fetal pigs, whether we're talking of newborn humans, liver is large and it's going to be multi-lobed structure. And you remember from our earlier course content that the main function that we were interested 
in this case of a digestive system was that the liver produced bile. So that can lead you to also try to find the gallbladder under the liver. This is going to often have a greenish color. That's the structures that stored and concentrated bile. And if you're doing a very careful job, you might even find the bile ducts. Other structure that I'm asking you to identify and later on to remove is going to be our stomach. That's going to be located at the upper left abdominal quadrant. And that's, of course, the place where the food goes to be stored and processed. In this fetal pig, stomach is going to be fairly empty. So it's not going to be this rounded structure that you're used to. It's probably going to look something more like this as our deflated uh, balloon. And of course, I'm also asking you to try to connect the oesophagus that attaches to the stomach through the cardiac of the stomach. Uh, continuing with a little bit more detailed structures, uh, I encourage you to look at the site where the oesophagus enters the stomach. This site was known as our lower oesophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter valve. Remember that this is not an actually anatomical sphincter as such, it's more of a physiological one, so you might not see a muscle band there per se. At the end of the stomach, before the small intestines and duodenum starts, you will find pleuric sphincter at the end of the pleurus. And, and then I asked you to also remove the entire stomach. So cutting from the lower oesophageal sphincter and cutting from the pleuric sphincter, removing the stomach and cutting it open. There will be liquid inside uh, and you might want to do that on a second dissecting tray for that reason. And the structure that we're after there are those folds on the internal structure of the stomach that were arrugae that allowed the stomach to stretch and then shrink as needed. We saw rugae elsewhere as well, so for example, in our urinary bladder. So a structure, a term that I'm wanting you to actually have an experience of seeing yourself now. Then we continue looking at the intestines. So leaving from the stomach, we're going to get moved to the small intestines. And I'm expecting you to see duodenum, the initial part after the stomach, and then the more distal part, which is the iliac. Remember, the small intestines is the major site of absorption. And uh, we will end up seeing a lot of this uh, connective tissue looking structure around the intestines. This is our mesentery holding the structures on place. And you might also see a lot of arteries and a lot of blood supply in general on the area of mesentery. So remember, there's a rich blood supply to the small intestines, so we can really absorb all of those nutrients. Uh, that small intestines is processing. Continuing on, you might see a fairly, uh, fairly, quite a few students do end up seeing the pancreas uh, kind of underneath the stomach. This was the structure that made insulin. And of course, for our purposes, the pancreatic juice, the most complete digestive secretion. Uh, if you're dissecting very carefully, you might even be able to follow the pancreatic duct from the pancreas to the duodenum. Uh, often fairly prominent in fetal pigs, the spleen on the far left next to the stomach looks a little bit like a funny looking lobe that could be even confused to the lobes of the liver, but definitely separate from the liver. So look for the spleen and you might even see the splenic artery. And uh, then I ask you to look for the large intestines. Uh, and you can start with the cecum, the first part of the large intestines after the uh, small intestine. So follow this large intestines as well. And if you really want to challenge yourself during this dissection, you can actually try to stretch out the uh, intestines, the entire digestive tract of the pig that you're working with. 
on a second tray. And you'll end up seeing that there's a lot of length in there packed in a very small space. Um, when you have removed your intestines from the abdominal cavity, you will see at the very back of the abdominal cavity two kidneys, one on each side. Uh, and you can also follow the uh, ducts that connect them to the urinary bla bladder. Uh, this urinary bladder is going to be flattened in your fetal bigs. There's not going to be a lot of material there. But if you follow uh, the structures, you might be able to identify that nicely. And this is the time when, I, uh, when, when it becomes useful. If you didn't remove the umbilical cord, you can actually now backtrack and follow and identify the umbilical cords as well. Here's a nice sketch that might help you with identifying some of the structures that we've talked about. So looking at our oesophagus joining to the stomach, uh, we see our prominent liver with the gallbladder underneath it and bile duct. And notice how bile duct opens to the small intestines, first part duodenum. Continuing this journey, you might also find pancreas underneath the stomach, follow the uh, small intestines. I mentioned spleen that kind of appeared a little bit like uh, similar to the lobes of the liver, but it's going to be on the left hand side, far left, uh, underneath the stomach or on the side of the stomach. So uh, prominent there. You can also see cecum from the large intestines and then the remaining large intestines until we get to the rectum and anal area. And uh, I also mentioned that look for the umbilical vessels. This is why we didn't remove the umbilical cord at the earlier stage. So I have some questions that are fun to practice uh, to kind of test that did you get everything out from that dissection activity that part that I had assigned for you? I'm just going to leave them for you to have a look yourself. If you're curious of those, we do them in a class. And then we keep continuing our dissection, moving further down and now looking at the urogenital area. So like I told you, I asked you to look for the kidneys. Uh, remember these bean-shaped structures at the very back of the abdominal region. Uh, you can also possibly find the renal veins running in there. We looked at the ureters running to the urinary bladder um, that are often located between the umbilical vessels, and we also might be able to find the urethra there. For the genital area, uh, we're going to see obviously different structures between males and females. So males, you might be able to identify the scrotal sacs between the legs uh, with the testes located inside and epididymis around the testes. And then our vas deferens or ductus deferens or ductus deferentia running from those. And remember, it was the vas deferens that was cut during the process of a vasectomy. And you might be able to also identify the penis on the male fetal pig. For the females, uh, many groups did a beautiful job of locating the ovaries and the very fine oviducts, the uterine horns, uh, and following those to identify the uterus. You can also see the urogenital opening and urogenital papilla, those structures that we started our external investigation when we identified the sex of the fetal pig. And again, I believe that I have two nice diagrams that might help you. So we've talked about the gray areas. So let's focus on the blue structures. So for the male fetal pig, you might see the scrotal sac and the vast deference coming out. And you can see also the urethra. For the females, the ovaries with fine, fine, find oviducts or uterine horns running from them, all the way connecting to the uterus. Um, with the uterus, um, you can also help probably identify the urinary bladder and the urogenital papilla, the prom prominent external characteristic 
of the female fetal pit. Now that we've had a look of the abdominal region and pelvic region, we're ready to move on and have a look of the thoracic cavity. So now we're doing two further dissection cuts. So we're cutting through the sternum and exposing the chest. And again, layer by layer. And again, if you have hog tied the pig, it's going to be easier to work on this area without the legs getting on the way. So there's a lot of structures that I'm asking you to identify there. Um, you can start with the diaphragm, which you are already familiar from the abdominal region. And you can also try to identify, let's start easily, the big prominent lungs. Between the lungs, you're going to have your um, heart located nicely there at the pericardial space. So that's a worthwhile structure. And then you can work your way through to the finer structures. So looking at the finer structures of the heart, uh, I often encourage my students, remember to identify which one side is front, which side is back, and from there start to do the reverse logic, uh, noticing first the pulmonary trunk that divided into two, and that allows you then to uh, notice your uh, aorta. Um, and again, uh, if you take the heart out, and might make it a little bit easier to see some of the further structures, the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, both carrying blood to the heart. So superior vena cava from the front legs and head and neck region, inferior vena cava from the rest of the body. You might be able to find uh, jugular veins on right and left side. Obviously, we already found the lungs. Notice how spongy they are in texture. And again, on the right and left side of the heart, uh, you can identify your trachea, so the windpipe carrying the air to the lungs. And if you're very careful and have been working Gently, you might be able to also see the thyroid gland on top of the trachea. It's kind of this V-shaped structure, and you remember many functions such as metabolism and controlling of the growth that are associated with the thyroid gland. Again, I have a bunch of questions just to make sure that you have gotten everything out that you needed to get in terms of learning from structures that we can see from thoracic cavity. So I encourage you to have a look of those. And um, you might be able to see some of the arteries on the lower part of the fetal pig as well, such as the external iliac arteries and femoral arteries as well as iliolumbar artery. So I encourage you to take the time to keep working through the fetal pig, looking for those. And let's see, I think we can now see nicely some further structures that I've highlighted there in terms of the vessels. So abdominal aorta running nicely down uh, the renal arteries supplying our kidneys, and uh, then dividing further down to the uh, external iliac arteries. From the very end, you also can follow the umbilical arteries to the umbilical cord if you were careful with that. And remember that external iliac then turning into femoral arteries. That really completes the review that I had prepared for the uh, fetal pig dissection. Some of my groups in the class this semester were eager to also have a look of the developing brain. So again, layer by layer, carefully first exposing the dome of the skull and then using the weakest parts of the skull where the fontanelles, the junctures of the uh, skull bones would be present, uh, opening that, removing the meninges until they got to see the actual brain. And we saw that there were less of the bumpy appearance on the cortex of the fetal pig brain than we were expecting with the human brain, but there were some of those. Uh, often the brain is not as well preserved in the process 
of the uh, of the embalming, but uh, there were some very beautiful ones that students dissected and shared with the rest of the class. And I think that at this point, it's a good time for us to stop sharing this screen. And um, I really have appreciated you joining me for these live online sessions throughout the semester. We're going to have one more of those next week, or actually two more of those, but those two cover the same material as we review the study guide, for exam four, and prepare for the lab practical four. Remember that we have classes where we do the same uh, in person next week as well. And once you've completed your exam for and lab practical for, you probably have a very good idea where your grade will stand at. So uh, I'll try to get you your grade standing updated as quickly as possible after the next week so you know exactly where you're standing and whether you want to tackle the finals week project uh, for bringing up your grade or are you happy with where your grade already is at. And that really completes everything I had planned for us for today. I really appreciate you joining me and I look forward to seeing you in class next week for our final kind of a class session where we go through the study guide for exam four and practical four. Uh, for now, I hope you have a very good and relaxing weekend. And uh, I really want to thank you for all of your hard work throughout this semester. Thank you and bye.